it's like part of the crew. What's like, up, what? everybody? Sean here with another live live to roll. Uh, this week we got a fun show. One of my good buddies is on with us, Austin. Uh, good buddy from rugby, known for years. But we're gonna talk about all kinds of different cool life stuff, like living in Guam and metal fabrication and all kinds of crap. <laughs> uh, but you guys know uh, I'm a Sean C5 C6 quad from a snowboarding accident 17 years ago. Tom, you want to do a quick intro? What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome back. Thanks again for joining us for another Loop Roll episode. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm Tom Conway. Um, as most of you know, anybody new out there, what's up? Nice to meet you. Uh, I've been a, a C5, C6 quad for 24 years uh, now. I uh, do my thing here in SoCal. Uh, but we'll toss it to the uh, main guest uh, of the pod, um, Austin. You might introduce himself for us. Oh, yeah. Austin and uh, what am I a uh, C six C seven quad? Pretty sure, uh, but I think so. Yeah, been hurt for going on fifteen years this year. I think so. Or yeah, fifteen years this year. Long ass time. <laughs> yeah, man, it seems like it, right? Just <laughs> the time flies, bro. It's just the years go by. Um, but yeah, dude, I met Austin. Um, it was a while, like early on in my rugby career. Like I feel like I was pretty new to rugby. And Austin was already kind of good and uh, definitely a little more advanced than I was. But, oh, did we freeze? Austin freeze? Oh. Uh-oh. But, uh, Sorry for the but, difficulties. <laughs> uh, we'll see if we can get it back. It's here all right. Yeah, I might have just froze for a second. We'll hopefully get him back right now. Um, but, yeah, I'll just mention real quick again. Like, yeah, Austin was a man, dude. He helped me out a lot in the beginning, too, uh, with rugby and stuff. He's a super good player. <laughs> Uh, traveled and trained with Team USA for a while and was uh, close to the Olympic squad. I think he did make it for a while. Um, but, yeah, he's awesome, dude. We'll get him back in a second here. Uh, An awesome example of, like, someone who, you know, like uh, it's so cool to get to have, like, a bunch of cool examples of people that really don't let their disabilities, you know, define them or limit them in any way because um, he's always pushing himself and doing crazy stuff that, you know, a lot of quads would probably think would be impossible. Um, what's up, Donna? Um, hey everybody! Um, I don't know why, but I'm not getting the comments on the ecam thing like I usually do. I know I don't know why that changed it up, but oh, here we go. Let's see if we get Austin back here. All right, we got you back. There we that go. was CJ's fault. He called me, bro. And kicked me off everything. So. <laughs> no worries, man. No worries, dude. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Uh, I, I was just giving like a little quick intro on how we met back in the day, like er, rugby, and uh, just saying, yeah, you're a badass rugby player. You're you're a little more so like people that have watched the show. I explained I'm a point five, me and Bobby and Tom, so we're like lower yeah. pointers. Uh, Austin's a two point oh, so he has a little more function than we do. He's ball handler. He's kind of in the middle there. You want to show some yeah. of your hand function? Yeah. See, so he's got oh, some sorry. metal fabrication. <laughs> yeah. So he's got really some cool. decent hands. Yeah. Back. Like that, so yeah, so some hand function, and that's kind of how rugby works. What's that, Tom? I said, What'd you say? Did you just come from the shop or something? <laughs> yeah, I say my hands are so dirty, man. I just I had to run to the shop and try and make this bracket real quick right before this live. Sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah, no worries, dude. So that's, that's what we were gonna say. Right? So, so I mentioned on the you know, our, the name of the thing was talking, we were gonna talk about like your scuba diving stuff in Guam and all that, but. Uh, Austin owns a fabrication shop in Vegas and does metal fabrication work, uh, like custom jobs and does welding and all kinds of stuff. Like our other buddy, Jeremy, who we've had on here, who's also buddies with Austin. We're all friends, too. Uh, but yeah, no, Austin does all kinds of metal fab work out there and has his own shop and everything. Dude, it's pretty awesome. So uh, let me ask you a little bit about that, Austin. How the F do you weld as a quad? With limited hand function and like, you know, high temperature torches and, you know, like all the precision and control that comes with, you know, metal. Yeah. So, like, just a lot of time, to be honest with you. So, I've been welding for forever. Like, quick backtrack, real quick, though, is that, like, so Jeremy is an unreal welder. I am a decent welder, but Jeremy is unreal well just to make that clear to everyone. all right yeah so shout out to jeremy jeremy is, yeah the function that he has and what he does is unreal but anyways 
So, like, I do a lot of... Jeremy makes, like, a lot more art pieces and smaller stuff like that. Like, so... Yeah. I make a lot more stuff that's bigger. So... But I make, like, roll cages. I make, like, bumpers and stuff like that for off-road stuff. I make pretty much anything and everything. We make stuff for race cars and build roll cages and race cars and drift cars and stuff like that. But, so... Yeah. I do a lot of MIG welding, uh, which is like considered like the squirt gun of, mel- of welding or whatever. But so that <laughs> one, like um, this hand, is good enough to pull the trigger on a MIG welder. So like that part is just the biggest disadvantage in a chair is like positioning for really any welding. I would say like it's just not having abs and stuff like that. But then uh, I also TIG weld as well. So like I TIG weld the same as like Jeremy does and. Me and Jeremy yeah. tick almost identically. So, use I put the torch in this hand because I can weave it to the point where it like doesn't move in my hand. So this is my like less dominant hand, the way it's less functioning. And I use this hand because I got more dexterity and stuff. And so when you're TIG welding, the rod is the one that you have to be more precise with. The torch okay. you just pull it like a same level or whatever, but your hand you're. Yeah is where you got to be precise. So my good hand is when I use the rod. And then right. for TIGWA, you control the temperature with a normally a foot pedal. But So Jeremy and I both do the same thing. We put the foot pedal on the bench, and we put our elbow with the TIG rod on there, and we use our elbow to control the heat of the torch. So it's a, it's a process. And I mean, I mean, I started welding like Cripple probably 12 years ago. And so Damn. it's it's taken a lot of time, like and a lot yeah. of hours to learn and messed up a lot of stuff and frustrated and more times than I can count. So like any bones or anything like that? Like, oh man, that's what I would be so afraid of is like hurting myself. Like with Yeah, so time. I have it I have I'm I'm been known to get some burns here and there. Let's see here. <laughs> so I can pull this one up a little bit closer. So Oh my all gosh. Of that, so that burn right oh, oh, right there is from a plasma cutter. This one, oh, no, this one up here more. I don't know. It's hard to look how the camera did. These birds are all, because they're on my less dominant side. So what happens is I don't have the feeling. So a lot of those birds are really old. I don't get burned nearly as much as I used to. Like that's another part of the whole thing. It's just learning that What's learning hot? process, that, that's, uh, but that's a that's that. a pr- pretty rough learning curve when you're getting burned every. <laughs> yeah, it is. I say like, and so I I definitely have learned. I mean, I have another burn that I got from nothing welding related. I was cooking dinner and burned myself on the stove. Just Dude. normal quad stuff. I actually lived with another quad. I don't know if you know him. His name is Gabe Garcia. He lives in Austin. But uh, cool, did we like? Uh, yeah, he's the first. Yeah, see, he's a cool dude. So, uh, me and Gabe, I lived up in North Texas. Gabe lived in Dallas. And uh, we were both, like, newly injured. Gabe was, like, a little bit older than I was, but he would he got just hurt, like, within the last year and a half or so. And yeah. me as well. And we met each other through rugby, and uh, we both wanted to move to Austin. So, we ended up just getting an apartment together. And me and Gabe, yeah. there. Gabe's a one-pointer, and I'm a two. So, he's got a little bit more function than Sean, so... Yeah. He, uh, yeah, not much though. Got, no, not a Ted. But before he got hurt, he was a chef, like a pretty well known chef, from what I understand and stuff. So I used to cook food all the time with Sean, or not with Sean, with uh, Gabe. With Gabe. And I'd be like his hands, then he would just tell me what to do all the time. So he'd like cook us food and stuff. And he was cool to live with him, but one day I had messed up and I put the pan in the middle of the stove, and then I put it back on the burner. I didn't think about how hot the middle of the stove probably was, and I put my elbow on the stove to balance, and I, oh. uh, I felt pretty good on the back there. So I ended up having to get a skin graft. There's a whole ordeal, man. So. Yeah, one of yeah, the gnarly things I ever got was on the outside of my elbow, and it was a similar thing. I was like trying to make some scrambled eggs, but I was just trying to like make it really legit. So I took them off the heat, and I was stirring them off the heat, but my elbow yeah. was right over the burner. Just cooking, and it was that underside, just like you, and I couldn't feel it. And dude, my uh, whole elbow was just cooked. It's pretty but gnarly, but you know, it is. It. I burnt it, uh, yeah, and I one. know that I burnt it. So I actually 
finished cooking the eggs, did all of our stuff, and Gabe and I had rugby practice. I got in my car, and at that time, I was playing a lot of rugby. That's when I played for the Austin team, like, years ago. Or whatever. He just that was when I think the, I first met you. Was it, I think you were playing. Yeah, maybe, say, maybe we just had remember. a lot of gym time all the time and stuff, so we practiced a lot. So my arms were, like, tore up all the time. So I was in the car driving to practice, and, like, my armrest was, like, kind of, like, scabby, you know what I mean? I thought it was just my arms from my wheels from rugby and stuff. I get to practice, and I don't remember who it was, but they're like, hey, man, what'd you do to the back of your arm? And I went like this, man, and I wiped it off like that, and all the skin came off the back of my arm, bro, at rugby practice. Oh. And I was like, oh. Like, and then I just immediately thought back, like, I know exactly what happened. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, that's but, rude. Uh, yeah, that was oh, a rough dude. One. That's gnarly, bro. Yeah, that is super gnarly, man. Is that the worst you've done, I guess, I, I would hope? Yeah, that's the worst, bro. So that one, that was just rough all around, man. So my mom uh, is retired Air Force now, but my mom was a doctor in the Air Force. So she was stationed in San Antonio at Brooks Army Hospital. And uh, so I, like, FaceTimed her on a phone, and I showed her what was up, or I took a picture and sent it to her. And she happened to be working on the burn unit when I hit, when I sent her the picture. So, like, one of, like, the best burn surgeons in the country was right there with her. She just showed it to him. And I was, like, already halfway to San Antonio where we were practicing anyway. And so within, like, two hours of that, I was in surgery to get the skin graft. But, Crazy. Wow. Uh, Crazy. But yeah. then I had spent a week and a half in the hospital with a wound pump. But I was at Brooks Army Hospital where all, like, our wounded warriors come back to so I felt terrible the whole time I was there. There's a bunch of guys that have, like, legit real injuries there, man, that they're, like, trying to do. And I just had, like, this little spot on my elbow. And they're, like, I got nurses' time. And I'm, like, just leave me alone. Like, go help those people that, like, actually need help. Leave me alone. Yeah. Just let me go, yeah. please. But I say that was rough, man. So. Yeah, no, that's and, uh, Yesterday was Memorial Day. We should, you know, comment, you know, like, say something about, okay. uh, you know, all the – um, fallen heroes, you know, out there that have, you know, served our country and, you know, yeah. sacrificed, you know, ultimate sacrifice. So appreciate everybody, you know, who watches, you know, we know we have some people that watch who have served in, uh, you know, armed forces and stuff. Uh, lots of love to everybody, you know, anybody with family in the military. Yeah. Definitely. For sure. Shout out to all the veterans. Definitely. Right. But, um, man, what do you guys want to know, man? I got so, a lot of stories I talk about. So why... We, we talked about, well, we'll get to Guam. Um, get to more of your story. I got a question now. Uh, how the heck did you get injured, Austin, if you don't mind um, okay. just telling your story? How did you get injured? Uh, so when I was 17, I fell asleep driving, but I went off like a 120-foot cliff. <laughs> and I uh, like landed on the roof of my car at the bottom. And then, uh, yeah, same. So, but like I guess like when I went off the cliff, I kind of spun and I hit a telephone pole. That's really, I guess, how I broke my neck because from hitting the telephone pole, it, like, stopped my car and, like, sent it to a flip. And uh, that, like, whiplashed me. So I broke the seat over in my car and I broke the headrest off. So I actually ended up breaking C5, 6, and 7 in my neck. And I, like, teardrop fractured all of them. So I broke them, like, yeah. vertically up and down. And so, yeah, I have, like, rods and screws and all that stuff. But no one saw me crash. So I ended up being there for, like, four hours or something like that. And then uh, the power companies actually found me because I hit that telephone pole and like, it like went over and stood straight up and down. So they couldn't, they didn't like, the dude drove past it a couple times. But yeah, I was down there for a while, but they found me and still not kicking, but I'm still here, you feel me? <laughs> hey, hell yeah, man. We're glad you're here, bro. Um, yeah, bro. That's a crazy story. I was going to say, isn't part of that... Um... Weren't you, like, partly in a creek, too, or something like that? Um, yeah. Like, so the underwater? story, like, I, I dub it down and, like, narrow it out sometimes because sometimes it feels like that. But, yeah, so I landed in – I was in Montana, and I landed in this big valley down at the bottom, and it was, like, snow runoff because it was, like, uh, July, like, all the creeks running off or, like, snow runoff. And uh, so it was really cold, and I landed in the car – and then somehow or another, I ended up, my car landed upside down, but I somehow I got flipped around in my seat, like in my seatbelt. So I was facing my seat. 
And so I landed and just like my face was out of the water. But yeah, the water was super cold. And so when they found me, I was like 84 degrees. I had a wakeboard in my car and it like hit me and it like scalped to the top of me. So that's like a big reason I have like long hairs. I have like a scar that goes from here to here, like across my head because it like scalped my head back like that. But yeah, I say. But yeah, I got super no, lucky because we stopped and actually ended up being like off duty paramedics. So, like, that was, like, a, a lot of things lined up. You were more lucky. Okay. Bitch, <laughs> you know, man? Yeah, dude. Like, sometimes luck does play into these things, man. Like, because, well, yeah, like, that's you know, a I'm crazy also, situation. Man. I'm also curious, and there's probably no way to, like, know this or, like, vet it. But, like, I wonder if, like, the submersion in the water, you know, like, your hypothermic state. Oh, it help had to The inflammation yeah. from, you know, getting to a degree, like, that is crazy. Because you guys both hurt back, like, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but, like, when I got hurt, you got hurt, Sean, and I mean, you got hurt way before us, even, man, like, 2006, like, my spinal cord rehab, like, I went into a rehab here in town the other day, it's called Driven, it's like a rehab facility here in Vegas, it's super cool, man, if you're, anybody in Vegas, check it out if you're a quad, man, it's like, super set up for spinal cord injuries and stuff, but anyways, I went in there, man. And the amount of technology that they have in that building is insanity, man. When I went to rehab, and I went to the University of Washington Rehab Center in Seattle, and uh, what you mean, at the time, it was considered one of the 14 spinal cord institutes in the United States. It was one of like the top hospitals in the country for doing yeah. what we did. Our gym consisted of a rickshaw machine, like a like. Oh, I know what the rickshaw is. Yeah, like, dude. Yeah, flat benches to get on and off of, and then uh, what should we call it? And then we went to the hospital. I learned to transfer onto the couches, like in the hospital lobby. What? Like we <laughs> went up and down. Like I had a dude that was next to me that was similar in injury to me, and my physical therapist would take us down to the basement, and there was this long loading ramp, and like in my head it was three miles long, like because remembering it, but I'm sure it was only maybe a hundred yards, you know what I mean? But like, he would make us race up that thing, bro, like three or four nice. times, like every day, like the last session of therapy. So like, and that was like what we did. And now I went into Driven here, man, and they have a machine that like calculates your gait between your steps and stands you up with like a rope, like, and walks you in like the craziest stuff I've ever seen, man. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, cool to see how well, far everything goes. Cool. Um, Driven, that's a cool place. Like, man, I'd love to like go down and visit and check that out. Um, but right. if anybody's uh, in the Vegas area um, and is curious, definitely look into that because, uh, you know, you said it, man. Like, impressive technology like that, you know, like can make oh, yeah. a difference for you know an individual in our situation like this. You know, rehabbing right. and stuff, and not even near term after your initial injury, but you know, like fifteen right. years, twenty years down the road, you know, like it can really be beneficial. Oh, yeah get in and work your body in those different ways. Right. Uh, so very cool. So anybody that lives out here in Vegas or like has a not great situation going on for disabilities, wherever they live or whatever, you know what I mean? Like not a lot of resources and stuff like that. Um, there's been like, I've been to a couple, I have a city council meeting tomorrow. And the city's actually trying to build like a whole disability sports center here similar to like ability 360 in phoenix then, dude uh, that would be awesome that in the works that i've talked with people about and stuff so like there's a lot of people with a lot of drive and a lot of funding to want to do these things so vegas in the next few years man it should be like definitely growing in like the disability sports realm man and that has a lot to do with like bradley bow like he's a newer dude yeah. like in the scene and stuff in but like as far as what he's doing for rugby in vegas and disability sports in general and between him and his dad and his family and they're they're, they're working hard man and it's cool to see yeah, I'm not sure. I, I could even I have glad. him and you on here another time once you guys get stuff going it'd be cool to talk about the progress right. that's going on in vegas and all the stuff that's because yeah that's yeah. really cool man like that's that's awesome i've seen a lot going on there a lot more accessible yeah. stuff so and it's cool too that they're involving us so like they like are reaching out to have like this is in the plan and developing stage like with the architect and that's like who the meeting is with tomorrow like the architect 
for this project here they're trying to build and like so they're putting in the effort to put like people with those abilities that understand what needs to be there doesn't need to be there and stuff like that they're at least putting the effort forth so you can't make any promises but it's just promising to see you know what i mean well there's yeah. something that i talk about all the time it's like gosh like Oh, I wish the healthcare industry would like have some quads like working in, you know, like the approvals, you know, department, like understanding yeah. some of these more complex cases and, you know, just like people of the community representing it honestly and, you know, right. like with the right kind of knowledge and expertise. You yeah, know, I mean, because like, they every day. There's cool dudes out there, man, that really are pushing that, man. And it's cool. So, like, there's a dude named Chase Ware, or, uh, not Chase Ware, uh, Chase Bearden. Sorry, Chase Ware is another friend of mine. But Chase Bearden that lives out in uh, Texas, in Austin. And he does, uh, he's a lobbyer, he's like a lobbyist or whatever. So he uh, lobbies like the Texas state legislature and gets like all sorts of stuff done on the regular, man. And he made, like, made all sorts of jobs within like the state and city parts to like that, that put people with disabilities in a place to help make those decisions. So like, I mean, like, I've kind of made my choices in life and what I do, I'm like, well, to do my stuff. But if there's, like, some young quads out there and stuff, man, like Sean and I were talking about before this, like, people want to know what they can do with disabilities, man. Like, and, like, if you want to see the change, like, be the change, you know what I mean? So if you're young, go to school and learn what you need to learn and go do like Chase does. Like, I mean, that dude makes real change, like, for people yeah. with disabilities. Like, you know what I mean? He makes jobs and different he makes a real difference in the disability community so that's and, you, know, uh, you know you know you have to wait you know like the beautiful thing is uh you start talking to your representatives and you know getting involved directly right now if you need to you know it's just a matter of like yeah. uh making the right calls you know going down to the city hall and you know just like asking to yeah. have a conversation um so i definitely love that message man and um definitely like anybody out there um find your voice you know like don't don't say you know think about it you know start talking about it you know that's like that's all it takes well you guys do it man you got this i mean like you're putting good stuff in yeah. the community, you know what i mean like this is things that like it's back to like me being young and a quad man this was no there was none of this when i there was no like it was just like a guess and hope for the best type deal all the time like hope i run into like well, I don't remember how many times I'd see a dude in a wheelchair, like in a parking lot or something like that, and be like stuck in this fool, bro. When I was like <laughs> first time, like getting into that other car, and I'm like, "Mom, stop! Just stop right here." Just I'm, like, stop. creeping over, checking him out. Like, what's this dude doing? How's he about to get in this car, bro? Like, you feel me? Like, so like this was what's there for me. Like, this is awesome that it makes it like, bro. Like, if you can quicken that like, learning curve for cripples, man, like get him back out on the world man like there's not there's not a lot of stuff like that should hold you guys back man i mean it's just and that's the that, that's what we're always trying to reiterate is there's not a ton of limitations other than the ones you often set for yourself i think early on or you know like the ones you create in your head because you know you're experiencing a lot of change and you know it may not seem like you know you can do the same shit but i don't know like i mean austin you're such a dumb example like it sounds like you're ripping and roaring before your injury and not much <laughs> really stopped after you kind of just you know kept on rolling um but that's cool so like talk to us a little bit about that if you don't mind like how was your rehab experience like it sounds like you went to an awesome hospital and you had like some cool opportunity to rehab but I mean, how long did it get to bounce back to you know just be in austin you know doing your thing so i man like i got so lucky man i can't even like express like from like as much as getting hurt sucks, like it worked out pretty decently well for me. Like I can't, I can't like <laughs> sugarcoat it in any way around it. So I got hurt and like, not like in the ways of like, I got like a $30 million settlement or nothing like that. You know what I mean? Like I didn't get like any of that thing or nothing. Like I just, man, like I went to Seattle, my occupational therapist and my physical therapist were just phenomenal man like it just matched my personality and everything like perfectly like because i i mean so like right before i got hurt like i mean like two weeks before i got hurt i was in the unit i was like i did track and field and sports and stuff my whole life but i was really good at track and field before i got hurt so like i was at the university of oregon high jumping like two weeks before i got hurt and, like 
been offered like a scholarship to go jump and whatnot. And I was a sophomore in high school. So <laughs> what you may call it. So like I had like was decent at sports before I got hurt. So yeah. as soon as I got hurt, like there's like a funny story from being in the ICU is like they told me that I was in a chair and my response was just literally like, All right, so like what now? Like I just like it wasn't dumb, like you know what I mean? I understood I couldn't move. Like I wasn't you know what I mean? Like I wasn't I understood what was going on, so what you mean? I went like two or three days. It was like, all right, let's go. What's the next step? <laughs> but what's funny, though, is like everybody thought like that I was just freaking out in my head. You know what I mean? Like not talking to nobody. So like two, three days later, man, like my parents, like a psychologist, and like all these doctors and the nurses. This is why I'm like still the ICU. Come in and they have like an intervention with me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Try and like break it to me that like I'm in a wheelchair. Like I'm like telling them, they're like coming at me like so do you understand like what's going on? And that was just like my response to them was like, Yeah, like I have no option. Like like I have to just get better. Like, you know what I mean? I have to go and just do whatever I gotta do. Just go start rehab, whatever y'all tell me to do, that's what I gotta go do. Like, you know what I mean? I don't have a choice. There's not like anything that me being sad here is gonna like say change anything, you know what I mean? So, yeah. anyways, nice. I ended up going to rehab in Seattle. It's amazing. Both those therapists, just phenomenal, man. Like, can't even stress how good they are. Jen, I still talk to her as my occupational therapist, like, to this day. I did a bunch of graffiti before I got hurt, man. Like, I used to, like, because I, that's what I got, I went to art school and all that stuff. But, like, I did art before I got hurt all the time. But I used to paint graffiti all the time, like, legal walls and all sorts of stuff like that. So, uh, that's why I was like hella bummed that my hands didn't work and I couldn't like spray a spray paint can anymore or nothing like that. <laughs> she went and got a whole bunch of cardboard and went and bought one of them little squeezy things for the top of spray paint cans, bro. And bought me some spray paint. We spent like five therapy sessions outside spray painting graffiti on UW's campus on um, cardboard out like just in the like courtyards, bro. People were looking at us like we were crazy. <laughs> but, but dude, it was awesome, that man. is what I love, man, is like, uh, I was like similar experience. I had an awesome OT like early on. Yeah. And I wasn't like, I was more than an adolescent dude. Like I was a little kid. I was like five, yeah, six yeah. years old going through my rehab. But you know, it was uh, someone that was like, not, it was like, let's sit in this therapy room and like do little things. It's like, let's go outside. Like here's, you know, some bubbles, like, you know, spill some soap on yourself, like blow some <laughs> bubbles, you know, like eat some ice cream, you know, scoop some ice cream out of this thing, you know, like have some fun with it. But like, those therapists that are able to, you know, make like make your therapy like it's more than just the physical therapy, dude. It's like the mental therapy, like, oh the shit, like way. I can do this. Like that I think is, you know, as valuable as like, you know, the physical skills, you know, you learn is like um just learning, you know, that you can do it again. See, you know, having yeah. someone who can show you and make things accessible, uh show you how right. to create you know, accessible things for yourself. Like that stuff is oh, places. Yeah. yeah, dude, you're very lucky to get it early on, for sure. But then, on top of all of that, though, man, is like that my parents are just awesome, man. They've just been cool my whole life or whatever, supported me and doing all my it's snowboarding and sports and just everything growing up and everything like that. And my dad quit his job the day I got hurt and that fool slept in a cot next to my hospital bed from the day I got hurt to the day I got out of the hospital. And I was in the hospital from July to October, so he slept in a little shitty cot next to me for all that time. Was there every day, did everything, man. He then I got out of rehab, and went home, man, and that fool went and bought me a car, man, and told me like we're driving, like that's the only way you're gonna be independent. And so like, <laughs> then six eight months I was driving, man. So you know, so. dang, that's cool, man. You were driving that quick after the accident. That's crazy. That's a like, lot, dude. That is like unheard of, bro. It's so like, wild. <laughs> but we did it just on the low. So like, what happened is my parents bought a car. My dad's mechanical. He bought hand controls, put them in there, and I had a driver's <laughs> license before I got hurt. So I figured I got a driver's license after I got hurt. So I never went to the DMV. It was good for like two more years or three more years or something like that. So I just yeah, rolled I with honestly, it, bro. I did the I same, with that I did the same ID thing, bro. Uh, I so, actually do the same thing. So that, how does that go for renewing it though? Like, do you have to like declare your disability or like is there so anything? When I, went, 
So when I so, went to renew it, I just, what you would call it, just bullshit it. Like, I'd been driving like this forever. Like, I didn't know no different. You know what I mean? When I gave them my ID, they were like, you don't have any endorsements on the back. And I just played it like, oh, like, I don't know. I just had my ID. They never gave them to me. What are you going to do? Like, take away my driving? Well, I, I did the I same thing, it. dude. I don't, I don't know. Because <laughs> I, I had to do the same thing. So I had... I did the same thing afterwards, you know, because I wasn't in an auto accident. Nothing ever cleared, like flagged at the DMV on my license. So my license was always good. Just started driving. I did take a little class and get a certificate. I took like a two hour driving class with a hand control guy in like yeah. a Camry. Like they helped me get in. It was terrible. I was so bad. Like anyways, but so I did do yeah. that. I'll claim that. But when I went to the DMV, I had the same thing. When I had to renew after, you know, like four or five years or whatever. Um, and he looked at it and he's like, he's like, you drive with hand controls? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay. And he just went and yeah. put it in the computer and gave me a new ID. <laughs> That's how I it, bro. Do it like you own it, bro. That's how I ran it. Bro. So, just do it like you own it. I don't know. We'll see what happens in another like couple of years when I go back. But I've been driving for like 10 plus or more than that now, you know, 15 years. So I have my van, I bought brand new in 07. So like... They don't yeah. complain anywhere, bro. I have. But anyways, uh, <laughs> we might uh, keep incriminating yeah, ourselves. <laughs> that's um, it's really amazing. Uh, I mean, you, know, you have an awesome family. I am also like, I mean, I say it all the time. I say it on the pod. Like every time, I feel like like one of the luckiest guys in the world too, because I got a mom and dad like you. You know, yeah. like my mom was same thing. I was in the hospital for six months, and she never yeah. left my side one yeah. time. <laughs> You know, yeah. and I mean, that was just it. Like, uh, you know, they were there, and like my mom also, like, uh, was a nurse. So, you know, like, I had the benefit, like, the luck of like having, you know, like a skilled nurse who was also, you know, like my mom and like the best caregiver. So, um, oh, yeah. you know, man, there's no beat around the bush. Like, and that's just kind of the stroke of luck, uh, you know, like we were fortunate enough to have. But, um, you know, it's, the, your support system really, you know, it makes a difference um, early on. Uh, yeah. and how you're supported and you know how you're elevated and um, you know can really uh, really make a difference. So that's cool to hear about your rehab story, dude. And uh, I gotta no. just real quick. I gotta shout my mom out because I'm she's probably watching in the chat right now. My mom was there too, like every day. She, she didn't stay in the hospital. She got a hotel right across the street, but she was there until she had to leave, and then right there in the morning every time. So, uh, shout out, awesome. yeah. well, parents, You're the parents, best. all the parents out there, <laughs> all the good parents. I was at Oakland Children's Hospital, and they had this. Um, it was called a Ronald McDonald Family Home, and it was a house mm -hmm. across the street from the hospital, sponsored by like Ronald McDonald, and. Um, they my family so i have a brother and sister who's a year older and a year younger than me and yeah so my dad was with them all the time and that was really hard you know my mom with me in the hospital and stuff but they were able to come and stay in the family home like across the street oh, that's awesome, yeah. a long time which was cool and dude that was like really like special and meaningful like i haven't really thought about too much like i'm a family there you know like across the street oh. like all the time you know uh, which is pretty, 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 pretty. Yeah, dude. Uh, uh, well, Austin, that's just where your journey begins. Well, your we'll say your quick journey because uh, you've been on one for a hot minute. Um, yeah. Now, how long was it before you ended up in Guam, and how the heck did that happen? <laughs> so, what should we call it? Guam is just a, just long. I don't know. I don't know how Guam happened, but it happened. <laughs> Call it. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was like in C six seven quad to decide to go to like you know arguably like third world like very in inaccessible right. country. Like, <laughs> so, I'll just break it down, man. So like, I just like I got hurt in when I was like younger or whatever, and uh, we'll talk about rugby later and stuff. But I got like really involved with rugby like super quickly. I played rugby like. That's all I did for eight, nine years, something like that, eight years or something like that. I stopped in rugby and I opened up a skate shop here in Vegas and I ran that in a studio and a bunch of other stuff. I'll talk about it later if you want. But that got me like burnt out. Like just talking about being a quad man, like and all that stuff. Like it's taken a long time to learn and everything. And like, but like we only have so much energy in the tank 
on a daily basis. Like it's just, it is what it is. You know what I mean? So I've worked really hard for a long time. I mean, like for like three and a half years running that shop and I did like big shows and like all sorts of different stuff. But I was working 12, 13 hour days for like, I don't know, seven days a week for like, like I said, like three and a half years or something like that. So what should we call it? I, um, what should we call it? Again? Here, let me pause. Cripple problems. I gotta take a piss real quick. Okay. No, you're good, dude. No worries. Uh, we'll hold the time. Um, yeah, it's all good. Uh, you know, that's, that's it, though. That's what we talk about the life, right? You know, sometimes you gotta go drain the leg bag. You know, you just kinda go do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, man. So, yeah, the, we'll kick, uh, we'll just uh, shout out a few base of spades in the chat. Heather Matson, uh, or Mattoon, I'm sorry. Uh, it's also a show, Um, and, and we did like, uh, we need to talk about, Terry. Uh, we talk about all the moms, but awesome grandmas out there too. Thanks for all the love and support. <laughs> yes, grandma. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, and Andrew in the chat, uh, he mentioned about being wanting to try scuba. So we're going to get into scuba. I know that's what I kind of put the topic as, but I knew with Austin, we we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff just because Austin's done more stuff than most people, like most older able-bodied people have done in their entire life. Like this dude owned a skate shop, ran a dispensary, now does a fabrication shop, lived in Guam, you know, traveled and played rugby for years. Like, uh, I can start talking about scuba a little bit. I'm no scuba diver or nor professional um, scuba uh, person, but I am like, I tried it uh, recently and that was like a big push for me. I'm not super comfortable in the water, um, like big fear of drowning for some reason. Um, and it was crazy, but it was an opportunity that came up with the Chime Foundation and this amazing organization called Dive Heart. Uh, Dive Heart is an awesome scuba organization that um, does like adaptive dive trips. They uh, organize funding. They do a lot of like um, experiences for individuals that want to try scuba diving. And I was fortunate enough to participate in one of those. And it was in a big Olympic sized pool and um, they set me up with the gear. And like I had two like instructors with me and they put me in the uh, pool and they brought me underwater and showed me the whole deal. And I got to like be underwater for like, I think it was like 20 or 30 minutes of um, experiencing it. Like it was coming up for air and, you know, like get used to it, learning how to breathe with the stuff. Um, but it was a trip. Um, it was crazy. You know, being in the water is a very unique feeling. Um, you know, like having your body kind of being able to manipulate your lower body and move a little bit and stuff. And that part was cool and crazy. Um, breathing was kind of tough with the uh, respirator. And it only got tough when I would like flip upside down or something, just be oriented in a way that was like non normal. But it was a life changing experience. Like it was crazy. It was so freaking yeah. cool. To- like be breathing underwater, like exploring, you know, like, oh man, I was like losing my mind. And afterwards, like, oh, it's crazy. Like, I love to try it and do it again. Um, but anyways, um, yeah. Austin, I've been, cool. I wanted to try that with Triumph too and just haven't got a chance to. But Austin's done a whole lot more than that. He's actually been, you know, in the ocean and all, all kinds of uh, real, like, live he's, crazy he's diving. He's a real scuba diver. Yeah. So let's. Right, man. Sure. You want? I was just uh, uh, yeah, I that. I was somewhere with rugby and one night recognizing real. Oh yeah, skate shop. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Worked real hard, wore myself out, man. So I got towards the end there, and my mom is in the Air Force, and she was stationed out in Guam, and oh, I had not okay. seen my parents in like a year or two because they'd been out in Guam, and uh, so they bought me a plane ticket. And pretty much just told me like figure out how to have someone run the shop and you're coming out to Guam. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I did that. And I flew out to Guam to go see him for like Christmas. It was, yeah, it was Christmas. And uh, Guam's just awesome, man. I was like, I honestly had like no real intentions of getting in the ocean. I normally don't, like didn't swim very much. Like I didn't get in water all that often. And so I was flying in and like, Guam's not very big. You can see most of Guam from an airplane, you know what I mean? So, and you just see like the blue water, like hitting the reef and breaking and all these waves. And like, bro, it just makes you want to like, you're just like, literally as soon as I landed, like so my dad, like, I want to go in the ocean. Like, and he was, <laughs> they were like, they were like, what? 
so I went out and we got, they had like snorkeling stuff or whatever. So we went out like the next morning or whatever, went out snorkeling. And I tried to drown for like two hours straight trying to snorkel. If you're quad, trying to snorkel is not that much fun. Trying to keep your head in a thing above water and waves are breaking and it's ruthless in the ocean. So anyways, I was like, yeah. well, that's not going to work for me. So my dad, like, had wanted to dive or whatever. So the next day we went down to the dive shop to go see if they would, what you may call it, like, let me dive with them or whatever. And they ended up being super cool dude, people or whatever. And the lady on the counter was one of the instructors there. And she uh, was like, I won't do it by myself, but I'll do it with someone else. So she had another instructor whose name is Martha came and they uh like taught me and my dad and my mom how to scuba dive just on like private lessons or whatever and like before i got hurt like i'd like wakeboarded and all that so i was like really comfortable in the water and even afterwards i just it's more so getting in and out it's really hard is why i didn't get in the water so much is that i didn't yeah. like the water it's just, it's just more so like it's a lot of work like i don't know it's fun to swim and all but it's not as much fun to get back out of a pool so yeah oh, especially so, you know, like stuck in wet clothes as a quad i'm like all right like let me go do this process and change it you know the whole, the whole deal right and so i ended up going there we went and did our dives and all that and i went and got this like open water certified which is like beginning certification you know what i mean um and uh, I, what you would call it, like, just enjoyed doing it, man. And I didn't have, like, a ton of stuff going on in Guam. I was, like, literally on vacation. I was there for, like, a month. So I was just, like, every day going and diving, you know what I mean? Hopping on the boat and diving. The people I was diving with were, like, my two instructors because we ended up being friends. And then Martha, I ended up marrying her. So she's my <laughs> wife now. So what you would call it. So. We were all friends, and we were so diving quite a bit, and uh, I just dove and dove and dove, and then I didn't want to go back, so then I changed my plane ticket for, like, two more weeks, and I stayed and dove and dove and dove, and then I changed it again for two more weeks, and I dove and dove, and then I was like, man, what am I doing? And so I, uh, my lease on the building that I had at the time was, like, coming up in, like, a month or two or whatever, so I... Uh, Hopped on a plane. I flew back here. My brother was getting married and stuff like that. It was like April, that time frame or whatever. And I flew back and I moved all the stuff out of my shop and I put it all in storage. And like, I had a screen printing print shop, a recording studio, a clothing store and skate shop. We did <laughs> like big music shows. We did like a two short show. We did, we sponsored Dizzy Wright. Like there's like a, Dude, Dizzy's my guy. I love Dizzy Wright, dude. He's like one of my favorite rappers. He's a Vegas like local too, right? That's so cool, man. But yeah, I'd say we sponsored his growing process tour through like, what was it, like 36 cities or something like that. So we were like a main sponsor with Moxie on that one. And then, uh, what you may call it? Yeah, so we just did all that stuff. And I just really like diving in Guam, man. I shut all that down, man. Like we had a studio that was booked out like 10 hours a day and we did. We had a clothing store and I had a whole skate team and all sorts of stuff. And we did like local hip hop shows like Fridays and Saturday nights. We had five, six hundred people out every Friday, Saturday night. It was cool, man. We did stuff. There's another artist named like Fora. We did some shows with Fora. We put Fora on like two, three times here in Vegas. He's a bigger dude. He's done like bigger stuff now. He's like grown quite a bit since we were yeah. there, even when he was there. But we did all that stuff, man. And we just like, sh I shut it all down, man. And I, did my brother's wedding and I hopped back on an airplane and I flew my ass back to Guam and uh, I just started diving man hanging out and uh, I went to like in the whole time I was playing rugby like I went to school in that whole time too and I went to art school for graphic design and so I uh, what should I call it I uh, did all that so I when I was in Guam I did some graphic design for a company called Docomo which is like the Verizon of out in uh, Guam or whatever so I did like part time work there and I just hung out yeah. and went scuba diving and I got a how shit long, how, certifications and <laughs> how long What's did that? you end up being? how long so were I was you in Guam for almost three years three years dang man yeah that's Pretty crazy close. bro they got right under three years so but yeah I say it was a blast man I say I went and I out on the dive boat like all the dive 
captains like dudes who drove all the boats are all like friends of mine and all instructors and I just went out and just went I went and got like master scuba dive cert. I went like pretty much as far as like I could safely go uh, not for my safety but for others like I'm safe diving and everything but you get to a point eh, there's me diving but uh, you yeah, get to a uh, point where uh, like other people start have to rely on you and it's not so much a knowledge thing as it gets into being somewhat of a fucking thing. So if you go into being a dive master and stuff like that, you're working with like new divers and you have to have, be able to have the function to be able to save someone's life. Yeah, so, they're like, relying on you um, in that in that case. And you got to be able to. Yeah. To so technically, like, um, what do you call it? Uh, rescue certified, which is like further than I should be. But I, I like. Sorry, bro. I'm like leaning the wrong way on you. But I, uh, yeah, that's cool. You do that. I did all the, uh, like necessary things and I could complete all the tasks. And I, like, had to drag a body up on, sh- like, not a, like a body, but like a limp person up on the shore and, like, do all sorts of different stuff for rescue or whatever. And I did it all, but, like, in no way would I be, like, tell someone, like, oh, yeah, I'm rescue certified. We'll be okay. Like, you know what I mean? Like, in that way. It's like, it, I know I am, but, like, in no ways would I be like, yeah, just rely on me. I'll, I'll keep you all okay. Like, yeah. I have the knowledge, but not necessarily the function. You have the knowledge, but not necessarily, yeah, the body function to uh, perform yeah. so all the rest of That's what I wanted to actually time. ask. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about was just the moving around and how well you can get around while you're in the, like, while you're swimming. Because I noticed you don't have fins on your feet, obviously, because you're not... You're not flipping yeah. your, le- your legs much. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah just, just ha- let them dangle. Yeah, you just let them dangle. <laughs> so, uh, my, my now wife and whatnot, they always used to give me a hard time because, like, when I swim in the ocean, I look like a seahorse. So my knees kind of pull up a little bit, and I kind of, like, I'm in a sitting position, kind of lean forward. When I swim, when I'm, like, down in the ocean, you know I mean, at 30, 50, 100 feet, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, swimming, like, I look like a seahorse, like in the shape of a seahorse. I used to have this little thing that float above me like a seahorse, but I'm not fast in the ocean. So when you dive, you have like that vest that's on you that has a tank on it, your tank on it and everything. It's basically like a life jacket. So you put, you add weight to yourself to help yourself go down and you can get to a point where you're like perfectly like non-buoyant. So like, you don't like float or sink at all you're just like neutral you know what i mean so you can air that little vest up just the little bits at a time because it's hooked to your tank and there'll be a little bit of air and you can literally just sit and not move and not go up or go down like you can by the amount that you breathe in will like make you go up and the amount you breathe out will make you go down so you know what i mean like the longer you dive you get used to it so swimming in the ocean and it's like for a cripple like if you can get in the water and you can breathe, like, it don't really matter. I mean, they can sink you down. If you can just control your breathing, but not, like, you can just hover in the ocean and enjoy it. You know what I mean? All the way to yeah. somebody like me that can swim around or a para that can swim like crazy. But the good thing about what? diving is like said that that's like a, uh, almost like a, a life preserver or whatever. So you air it up. So when you're on the surface of the water, you just have it full of air and you float. So you're not even swimming. So. so if you're, so if you like are kind of in trouble and like you need to get up, you can fill yourself up with air and kind of, it'll take you up to the surface a little bit. Like it. So you yeah. Can... But you don't necessarily want to do that. Just diving stuff. You get nitrogen in your body. Mm. Right? So you can't shoot up and, quick or you get the. Boots. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And so like, yeah, you go up fast and then they, molecules expand faster than they can get out of your blood vessels and they leave nitrogen bubbles in your body is what happens so but when you're in like bro like the number one rule with diving bro it's just don't spit out your mouth just don't spit out your regulator like okay. there's no, they can do anything you can bro you can do anything underwater because you have air you're breathing like you just have to not freak out and keep the regulator in your mouth and it don't really matter what's going on. It could take 10 minutes to get to the surface, whatever. Like, my fear was, like, coughing or choking or anything like that. Like, right. with the regulator, and you can still cough and stuff. Like, you know what I mean? You just do a little, like, <coughs> coughs, you know what I mean? So, 
not, not uh, like no, a awesome. very powerful cough anyways, you know? Yeah, <laughs> say it's not, you're going to be like, blow that regulator out of your mouth. Or uh, and even but, if you lose your regulator, though, you can put your regulator in underwater and get air back, too. Uh, yeah, when you, you put know? it in, the first thing you want to do, though, is just blow out, and you're going to suck in a yeah. bunch of yeah. salt water. Oh, but nice. You put it in, just blow out, and all the air will purge all the water out, and then it'll be empty and dry. Nice. And that was when I did it. So I, uh, a couple of years ago, um, did uh, scuba diving in like this big Olympic-sized pool with this organization called Dive Heart here in Southern California. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And um, that's what they said. They were like, number one thing, don't spit out the regulator. You know, like, this is, this is your life. Was bad. That's for everybody. That's just the number one rule with diving. Yeah. Like, no matter what and, is happening. Do not spit your fucking regulator out. <laughs> You'll be just fine as long as you can keep your regulator in your mouth. <laughs> and that was like the trick was kind of the mental like hurdle of getting over just like drawing breath underwater. Because for me at first, when I first went under, like my like first instinct is like hold my breath. <laughs> like even with yeah. the regulator in my mouth and stuff, they were like, all right, take a breath. I was like, it was hard for me to do it. To make uh, you but like, great. Right. I would have the yeah. same issue, I think, I feel like. At but first. as soon as I did it, as soon as you get that, like, the breathing down, which it only took, like, a minute or two to just kind of get the rhythm, and then you're underwater, and you, it's just like breathing. You're like, it feels like normal breathing, you know? And it was cool. Like, the people that I did it with were awesome, um, and they were just checking up me every minute, giving me, like, I give a little thumbs up, like, I'm good to go. Uh, and like I said earlier, the thing that I found was, like, a little difficult is they oriented my body like I was going like flat on my belly. I was almost going like head down a little bit. And um, sometimes in the position, like I just felt like it was hard to like pull in like a full breath. Not that I couldn't breathe, but I think just because of like how oh, that's so great. What like, was, <laughs> that isn't necessarily that. It's the regulator itself. So like regulators that the higher end regulators don't do that. So what's happening is you get over like that. And the pressure of the water, there's a diaphragm inside there that pushes open and close, and that's how you breathe in water. And so when you yeah. get into a certain position with some of those regulators, it makes it so it's pushing against that diaphragm. For you, so for you to be able to pull air, it's like twice as hard. You know what I mean? So if okay. you get a really quality regulator, you could do flips and whatnot, and they'll never breathe the same all the time. Yeah. And that's why you watch know. that small lungs. So... After I got over the initial part of diving at the beginning where I was, like, breathing big because I was, like, underwater and everything was new and all that stuff, like, once I was comfortable, I, uh, whatchamacallit, our, lung, our diaphragms are so small and everything, or not our diaphragms, but, like, the, our lungs, we don't ever take, like, those full breaths and fill our whole yeah. lungs up ever, so we breathe real shallow and real slow, just naturally, so I can take a tank like an air tank half the size of like the other guys I dive with and be able to dive that same tank in the time that they would dive top two of their tanks. Crazy. Because you're just yeah. doing the slow breathing. Yeah, you just like breathe it's smaller. Just natural, you know what crazy. I mean? It's just because we're quads. It's just like, yeah. we don't take big breaths. We don't have like, we don't have that. We're like, used to sipping and sort of like, like yeah. yeah. That's crazy. That's cool. Um, yeah, dude, it's funny. It's funny how you were talking about how you are kind of a seahorse in the water. So I used to be yeah. a lot more comfortable in the water. Like my family, we had uh, this little aquatic center that was a block away from my house. And my mom okay. would take my hands and toss me in the pool every day. And I learned oh, yeah. to swim. That's how I would swim. It wouldn't be on my back or on my belly, but I would float. Literally, my head would be one inch below the surface. And I would just be at that buoyant point where like I wouldn't be going down. I wouldn't be going up. I would just be floating there, up, straight up and down. And my knees would kind of pull up towards my chest, and I would seahorse yeah. a little bit. And I could wave and move myself from one side of the pool to the other. And what I would do is I would push up, take a little breath. I would sink back down to my little boy position, and then I was good again. Um, and I could navigate pretty well. Uh, but that's the kind of exactly how you looked, like doing your scuba thing, just kind of hanging in the water. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to that feeling. Um, I'm just kind of like finding that balance point. And it would, it freaked me out at first. And I didn't really like comfortable being under the water um, yeah. because I would float just below the surface. Like I wouldn't float on yeah. top of it. I would float underneath it. So, yeah, that's you know, a little sketchy. 
um, like get kind of used to that. But once I found my comfort zone, I did like I felt that freedom, you know. It's like and the oh, thing yeah, about being in, in the water is, you know, you can move your hips, you can move your legs. Like I can use my upper body to maneuver and shift my lower body and like really move around and it's crazy, dude. It's like a super unique feeling. It's very cool. Well yeah, man, I mean like I led a dive out in Guam and uh so there's two boats in the harbor in Guam. They called the Cormoran and the Tokai. And one of them sunk in World War Two, and one of them sunk in World War One. One. One's a uh, Japanese boat, and one's a German boat. But they sunk like a foot from each other. Wow. So you can touch the front of one and the side of the other one. They're laying right next to each other. It's a big so old is is Do you see like something 80, like that? Oh, I was that? just saying, some, something like that would be so cool. Like, I feel like that's what I would like to do. Like, exploring, like, a like a shipwreck like that. Like, oh, my gosh, that sounds so fun to me. Like, honestly. But I led my dad and then two of our other friends, like, dove. We went in the, like, front side of the Tokai, and we went all the way through the Tokai, through the kitchen, down to like the bomb bays and all the way down and out the big torpedo hole out at the bottom at like 110 feet it took what? like 45 minutes and it was like pitch black and going up and down stairwells and like it was dope bro crazy and like that was Dude, that's, been in a bunch so of sense, man. That, was that really sounds fun. so awesome bro like honestly that sounds so cool uh because like... he talks about moving your hips and all of that stuff like I was going through holes and stuff that are as big as my shoulders wide. So, like, that you know was, what I mean? Like, you can act, like, scary. in the water, like you said, you can, like, pull enough to, like, pop your hips up to be able to, like, pull through and stuff that you know, like, you just can't do in normal life. You know what I mean? Ex so. Exactly, dude. It's like you're at, like, zero gravity almost. Like, when you're buoyant underwater, yeah. like, you look like an astronaut. And that's, like, when they train, you know, for astronaut training, that's what they do. Yeah. They put them in a pool pool and we can move like that you know kind of our bellies like pulling ourselves along with our arms because in space or underwater you don't need your legs to pull yourself around yeah. like you know that's it let a lot of pressure on back all the time too man like being in the water a lot was really nice on my back bro like oh i'm sure since we dude. don't have abs and everything it just kind of like let it's like i felt like it like the comparison would be like um like being in one of those things that flips you up and down and hangs you or whatever yeah, but being in the yeah, water, yeah. you just like, and in the weight of your legs, like just pull down, just like, lets you like decompress and stuff. Like your back, yeah, I say it's nice. Yeah, it like, stretches sure. your body out for sure. Yeah, yeah that's awesome, sick. definitely awesome. Uh, yeah, for sure. Now, do you get Wait. muscle spasms at all? Yeah, I get some pretty bad ones, man. I uh, what you would call it? I flipped a Subaru going like seventy down the highway. How much spasm hitting the steering wheel? <laughs> scary. Oh, um, that was when I was moving to Vegas. I had all my stuff in my car, man. I have like a tortoise that's like this big, man, over here in the cage. And then I had a boxer in the back in a crate. And then like a bunch of my stuff that I owned, man, and sent that shit flipping out through the ditch, man. And sent my dog flying in a crate. And the tortoise was flying and went like slow motion, man. And I'm like, caught my tortoise like a football like midair as we were flipping and like <laughs> I, like the next day like this whole spot like this was like black because she weighs like 60 pounds so like it was like having like a 50 60 pound weight just like dropped on my arm when i caught her and i say it was ruthless man so yeah spasms uh, they're getting better i'm trying to figure out stuff man i got a new chair and that's helping a little bit man i say shout out to the dudes of hands-on concepts for sure nice yeah uh, yeah, do they trigger or are they better underwater? That's what I was going to ask too. <laughs> um, yeah, they trigger underwater stuff. So like, like it's just kind of like, I don't know, normal life shit. You know what I mean? Like I gotta yeah. take a piss, like more spastic underwater and shit. Some yeah. days they were chill, but all in all, they weren't too bad, man. You know what I mean? Spasming yeah. like super hard underwater is like a lot different too, though. You know what I mean? Like the, the tension of the water and whatnot, you know what I mean, it keeps your legs from, like, in free space, there's nothing slowing them down, you know what I mean, them bad boys yeah. are going where they feel That's like, true. you know, in water, it kind of, like, keeps it from being so jarring all the time, you know what I mean, so. Well, I feel like the, 
because like you have the resistance of like the fluid it like you said it, it makes it seem less intense like you don't feel that jerk you know when you're like pulling your body so intensely um i usually get it when i first go in the water like the temperature will really like trigger yeah, that me. Uh, you, man. yeah that's what every time yeah, I, I go crazy for like two minutes and then i'll usually yeah. pretty good uh, once I'm in the like, all right, we're tired out. We're chilling. <laughs> Here, Austin, I got a few questions for you from the chat, actually. We got Chad asking some questions. Uh, one was, what depths have you been able to dive to? Like, what's the deepest you've uh, you've been able to dive? So. <laughs> that coy smile says it's a scary And right moment. diving, <laughs> recre recreationally, only supposed to go to 130 feet. So I've been to 130 feet. Okay. <laughs> and that, that's I've, all he get. <laughs> I've been a little deeper, not too much. Like, I think probably like 155 by the deepest I've ever been. Damn, that's cool. That's but pretty crazy. That, you have like computers on and shit, and it's like, it's almost like it went 30 is fine, but your computers are all set to know your depths and all that, and they're like beeping and going crazy and pissed off whenever you go any deeper than that. So, whole time you're under there, your computer's just like beep, 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 beep. beep. It's like, all right, I'm going back up. I'm tired of this shit. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, let me ask you, though, dude. Like, the pressure at 130 feet, 150 feet, man. Like, what does that feel like on your body? Like, do you even notice it? Like, One atmosphere of water, like, is 33 feet. So, it's basically, yeah. like, from zero to 33 feet. That's the biggest change that you make. So, like... If you were to swim down to feet, that change in pressure and that pressure you feel on your head is the biggest pressure change you feel. From that atmosphere down and more, you just clear your sinuses basically, like, and it just feels like being at three feet of water. You know what I mean? Yeah. But there's other stuff though. So when you go down that deep, there's like, uh, it's called like narking out. So, like, basically what's going on is your body is like, not getting all the oxygen it needs to get it's getting too much nitrogen because your body's building so much nitrogen down there and uh it kind of feels like being drunk a little bit and you kind of like get all tingly and whatnot but like it's not super super serious unless you're like like being down there for a while like if it just happens for a minute and you come back up and like the nitrogen will burn off a little bit and you'll get the right amount of oxygen and nitrogen in your body and you'll feel normal or whatever it only lasts like seconds, you know what I mean? Unless you stay down there and then it keeps going. But it's like you're doing a whip in at 130 feet under the water. Pretty much. That's pretty much about what it is. That like, whoa. Like, that's pretty much what happens at 100. Not all the time, you know what I mean? It just depends on yeah. as much as like what you've eaten and what your metabolism's like and like all that different kind of stuff, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, I got another side question on that then. How, what's the longest you've ever dove for? Like how's, what's the longest you've ever stayed, stayed down? Um, so longest I've ever stayed underwater is probably like an hour 45. Yeah, that's cool. Most dives are like on average are like 45, 50 minutes long. But like, I'm really good on air. And so like, I've had like larger tanks on and stuff. And I've gone under with guys that are like really good with air looking at stuff. And like, if you don't go super deep, like the deeper you go, the faster you burn air. Because like, every one of those atmospheres cuts your bottle basically in half. You know what I mean? So like at the top, you might have, just say you have a thousand PSI in your bottle. You go down 33 feet and you got 500. You go down to 66 feet and you've got 220 or 250. You know what I mean? So like the deeper you go, the faster you breathe up air. So like if you're only diving at 25, 30 feet, like, you could be under for a while. Like my biggest determining factor being underwater was always, um, what do you call it? It's like my temperature, man. You know, we're quads. So yeah, you, oh, yeah. you become, and Guam water is warm, man. It's like warm. It's like 80 degree water all the time. But okay. even 80 degrees, being in 80 degrees for an hour plus, like, and you're a quad, like, you're heading on your way towards 80 degrees. You feel what I'm saying? Yes, exactly. Yeah, we're we're about 20 degrees uh, above that standard. Yeah, that's a big yeah, thing. Yeah, so like yeah, that's, that's a big thing determining time that I've been under, but it's not bad. Okay. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, I didn't even think about some of that stuff. But yeah, dude, the, the temperature makes a lot of sense. That's my sure. biggest factor. Like 99%, like I was saying earlier, like the amount of air that I use is very minimal. Like I dive at 50 is like what the tank is and call it. Whatever. But like I dive like a 45, 50 minute dive on you know, that tank and come up with like half a tank left. Just because like we don't. Like I was saying, quads, we just don't breathe that hard, you know what I mean? We don't work that hard, like, we can't swim all that fast. It's like, we're not working all these big muscles, burning up stuff and all that stuff. We're just kind of in there doing our thing, so, you know. Yeah. Nice, dude. Definitely fun, man. What uh, else you got for me? Yeah. Um, any shark yeah, encounters, Chad yeah. also For asked you. about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen a bunch of sharks, man. Sharks are awesome, but like, they're just... Nice. This, man, they don't want nothing to do with you, man. You're, like, lucky most of the time to see a shark. They, they're they gone, man. Like, I missed one night dive that I didn't go on, and they uh, they woke up a hammerhead shark, and it was, like, circling him and stuff for a little while, though, and then he finally took off. And, it, like, most, like, sharks are pretty chill, but, like, hammerheads can be a little bit aggressive, and they were at night. They were night diving, and they woke him up, and he was, like, circling the group for a little while, and then he took off swimming eventually. He was in the harbor, so. But, yeah, I say they got... All sorts of sharks. There's a place called Palau that's out by Guam. It's like the only shark sanctuary in the world. Like you go diving out there, you go dive, you'll see a thousand sharks on one dive. Like not even exaggerating. There's like points you can go out to. There's currents in the ocean and stuff. And there's like a point that you can go to that you can clip off to because the current's so hard that you can't outswim the current. So you basically just like it's like being in a river, like hooked to something on the side, and it's just. You can't go nowhere. The water's just pushing against you, going around you. But it's where all the sharks come up and like breathe and come by and pull out at a certain time of the year. If you go out there, there's just hundreds of sharks, as far as you can see. Nice, dude. And that's all yeah. pretty yeah. safe, relatively, to swim with them and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, they don't want nothing to do with you for the most part. I would part. say like, that that's... is probably more dangerous than the sharks. Like, um, like that water force will just carry you away. But I guess oh, that's yeah, really dude. Right. You're know, like dive mates and stuff, like the people you're with to like, you know, not There's make sure you don't get too far. There's volley that are like ocean fish or whatever, and they like shiny things, and they're not scared of shit. Like, they're more scary out in those. They have teeth and shit, so they're like, uh-huh. you have diving, you got a bunch of shiny stuff on you all the time, you know what I mean? So they'll come up and like get in your business and whatnot, and like, like, I don't know, I touched a stingray one time. That was probably mm. one of the sketchier things that I've done, but that was... He was just laying on the bottom and like just pet the side of him. He was super cool. Like wham off and did his thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, nice, dude. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. We, we are uh, past the hour, but uh, I want you to just keep it going for a little while because um, I'm kind of curious now, man. Like you've right. done a ton of cool and crazy shit. Um, you've been to Guam. You're like a scuba master, and now you're settled yeah. in Vegas again. Uh, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing these days? To I know you're running your metal fabrication shop. Is that like well, occupies most of your time? And you know, like, yeah, what other fun things are you doing these days? So that takes up a majority of my time. We're building a shop right now. Like, we're moving out of the shop we're in and building our own shop right now. So that's taking up a bunch of time. But man, I just hang out, man. I got my wife. Like, I got all my nerdy stuff back in the back you saw all my holly all my everything yeah, yeah, yeah. Has got a hell of a you got all your animals you got you got ellie yeah, yeah he's also got a pet pig down there for anybody that uh <laughs> hey do you still have your your tortoise from that accident or uh so here let me see let me go up here. I'm gonna, you guys are gonna have to roll with me that's cool we're good that's cool we're we'll, we'll end we'll, we'll close the show out with the Little show and tell here. <laughs> okay, let's start. Let's start with Bell Bell. She's gonna be pissed because I'm gonna move this chair. Hey, Bell Bell. So we got. Oh, no, this should be kind of part of the show, where I guess. Oh, that's the. Oh, oh I my know, God. Bell Bell. Uh, was, that's I awesome. <laughs> I woke her up. She's pissed. All right, Bell Bell. She's back. pissed. You woke her up. She's like, God. He's like, oh, I was coffee and sleeping. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Oh, doggies in there. I got also a damn one here. I got three dogs, the pig, and the mister. Oh yeah, that's what I wanted to mention too, because a couple of your dogs you mentioned you actually rescued from Guam. That like, because there's a lot of street dogs and stuff out in Guam. 
So Austin actually yeah. saved a couple of dogs and like you know got them back to recovery. Whoops, let me get it back to you. Oh, there he is. Nice, dude. That is, or there she is. Damn, bro. You what popped cool that thing. Terrarium, too. That is so badass. I built this. Yeah, of course uh, you did. I can see the metal fabrication. It's so dope. <laughs> See, yeah, I, that's why I got to keep stressing, like, how much you can do when you just, you know, if you put your mind to it, man. Austin's definitely an example. Look that's the man, Dobby. Well, he's from Guam. And then he's no, got I'm a brother. Where are you at, RJ? Oh, here's his brother. So those two guys. In Guam, there's a uh, large stray dog population in Guam. And so we found these guys on Christmas Eve in Guam on the side of the road and they were like hairless and they were like a couple weeks old they think they weighed like a little bit over a pound each like they were oh tiny my gosh. they were eating rocks and hairless and disease ridden and whatever else and so we took them and saved them and then paid a ridiculous amount of money to fly them halfway across the world so they could come live with us in Vegas so. <laughs> man dude that's awesome though that's very cool uh yeah dude that's so cool bro that's yeah uh, and, um so uh austin kind of one of the things that we usually ask to kind of wrap up the show is um have you got any words of wisdom or any words of advice for um any other you know quads out there any new quads anybody in the community disabled or otherwise um you know any real message you want to leave them so i don't know i guess like that there's not really no like if ands or buts about it like being a quad is hard as shit like and I, you just have to accept that. Like I don't know how else to put it besides that. Like that's just something that you're gonna have to accept in your life, and that life's not fair. And like it is what it is. Like, but the biggest thing is that there's always somebody worse off than you are, bro. Like I brag you guys up all the time, man. I'm grateful for the amount of function that I have, just knowing how much shit that y'all do with the amount of function that you have. So it makes it hard for me to bitch about shit. And I know there's people with less function than either of you. So yep. that's probably the biggest thing, man, is just be grateful, man. Shit is, life is life, man. It's not a bad deal. I say it's so much, bro, I've traveled where I've been. I went to Thailand by myself, traveled Thailand for two weeks by myself, bro. Damn, you had to piss crazy. in the fucking ground, guy. I've been to Brazil. I've played rugby. I've owned we're gonna, businesses. We're going to have to have you on the pod to talk about some shit again, man, because like but, these are yeah, some like, life goals just, that I have, man. And, like, oh, bro. I, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that there's no real like fucking whatchamacallit. There's always love for Paris. Say all of you, man. It's yeah, like, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, dude. We, it, it's all love everywhere, bro. The term purples, <laughs> man. I don't see myself as disabled. That shit, like, to me, that's almost more like disrespectful if you're gonna pick a word, I guess, than anything else. Like, there's nothing that I'm not able to do, which is that's what that implies. Like, I'm crippled. Like the terminology, like, I'm broken. Like that's what happened to me is I'm broken. Like I'm not not able to do things. Like I'm yeah. just crippled. Like I don't know how else to put it. So. Yeah, that's what's funny is people think that word is so much worse, but it's really I use it all the time too because. But it, you're right; it just means broken. That's what you you're broken. Like <laughs> yeah, the connotation behind it, I just feel like when people tell me I'm disabled, it's like almost like I take that as in the ways of like, well, what what am I not able to do? Like I've not ran into anything that I've not been able to do. I've fucking done a lot of shit. It's not always easy. <laughs> Don't get me wrong; some stuff I've done one time and been like, nope, that was. All I need to do. Yeah. I rode a exactly. century hand cycle ride. I rode a, I rode a hundred mile bike ride in August in North Texas, like two years after I got hurt. It was like a hundred and ten degrees outside, bro. I did it one time. I would never in my life do that shit again. That's what I'm saying. Like, I can do whatever That's I want, good. but that's a terrible idea. So I'm not disabled. I just choose not to do some things because they're harder than I would like to do. <laughs> no, right, for dude. sure. That, that makes like, yeah. exactly, bro. Sometimes it, you just got to try to experience things, man. Like if you want to yeah. do it, there's a way you can do it. You can fi you can figure it out. You might have to adapt something. You might have to whatever, get some help. Mm -hmm. But like, you can do it. And, you know, like everyone's dealt, an experience. Everyone's dealt 
a different set of cards, but it's not about the cards you're dealt. You know, it's how you play those mofos, you know? From life, dealing with a cripple. Oh. Hey. Hi, hey. Martha, how's it going? You must meet um, his beautiful wife, Martha, that we heard a ton about. It's really nice to right. see you and meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Oh, man. Speaking of Martha, this is what I'll leave you guys with. This is probably one of the coolest things that we own. And Martha found this for me in the bottom of the ocean in Guam. It is super fucking hard to find. But, and it didn't have anything living in it. Bit, but this is one of the coolest things. Marshall brought this up from the bottom of the ocean for me. Look at this shit. See oh, that wow. shell? Oh, like full... my God. Look at and that shell. <laughs> Grab it out. Go a little bit uh, left. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Dang, oh, that's like a full, God. that's like a crazy, that's wow. What a Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Yeah, that's oh, probably a hard find. I can only imagine what inhabited that thing at one point. That is really it's moving it up. Yeah, it's, it's a big old, it looks like a big tongue. Yeah, that's wild. Oh, what the? Well, yeah. Austin, dude, can I tell you how much we appreciate you being on the show with us today, man? Um, you know, I like, you. share all your cool stories and you know, all the cool shit, shit that you do, man. Uh, really appreciate it. And your um, awesome inspiration for, um, you know, a lot of people out there. Make sure to go check out Silver State Fab. Um, you know, check out his metal work stuff and uh, yeah, man, don't uh, also don't... Uh, Chad mentioned earlier about is there anywhere that you have scuba videos posted real quick for anybody if there are uh, and if not, no worries, but I just wanted if to. If you go on my Facebook page, it's just Austin Coger. There was this dude I took out diving one time and just got open certified and he made a super awesome video out in Guam and it's like a 10 minute like edited video. We are diving with like uh, like 12, 15 foot long nurse sharks. So, uh, super cool you can video. find the link and post it in the description, Sean, at some point. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe I'll actually try I to do that. I'll YouTube, do that. That's... I can, I'll help you look and see, Sean. I'll, I'll for see sure. if I can find it. So, yeah, because yeah, that'd be cool yeah, for man, people to see. That's a video of me diving. And if not, I'm sure there's one around. Like uh, that picture that you had of me was from a dude named Chase Ware, the dude that I said before. But oh, I got one more cool picture I was going to throw up just before we end. Oh, that's too, it's like too big. There it is. So <laughs> the dude who took that picture is who I was about to talk about. He owns a company called Liquid Soul. You can, like, find him on Instagram and stuff. And, uh, bro, like, if you want to see some cool pictures of the ocean, go check out his page. That man is a underwater photographer, and his mom... Liquid Soul. Leads, it's his mom leads the Manta Ray Foundation out of Guam. So she does all the research on all the manta rays. So he he actually is like help name and identify all the manta rays that are in like the Marianas area of the ocean. So, but yeah, awesome. check his stuff out, man. Awesome pictures of the ocean, man. Crazy shit. It's so awesome. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Check. I'll try to get all that in the description too uh, by the next episode. <laughs> so, so you guys thank you for everybody who uh, joined us today. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Uh, all the people that come back every week and watch us. Uh, anybody that's new out there, uh, we always uh, appreciate the love and you being here, hanging out with us, and blowing up the comment section and stuff. Make sure to hit that like button. Um, it really helps out the channel. Uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Um, you know, check it out. We're here every week. Got a lady show um, coming up this say, Thursday. And also tune in on Thursday. We got the lady show Thursday. So um, Brianna is going to be hosting. It should be an awesome show like it usually is. Um, so uh, appreciate all the love, everybody. Thanks, Sean, for doing all this, man. We'll see you guys next week.